On the First Army front, German civilians come out of the cellars of a factory in Stahlberg, about six miles east of Aachen. They'd been in hiding during the week-long house-to-house fighting for the city. Half of Stahlberg's 30,000 population had fled before our troops entered on 22nd September. AMG officials have been rounding up Nazi soldiers who disguised themselves in civilian clothes and joined the refugee columns. Near the Siegfried Line, an example of Nazi deception. A house frame constructed over a pillbox. Behind the camouflage are the steel and concrete of a strong west wall fortification. The house was designed so as to give maximum concealment to the main sections of the pillbox. This type of camouflage was also employed by the Nazis along the Atlantic Wall. Four and a half miles south of Aachen on 28th September, the Siegfried Line is photographed from the air. Only a few of the pillboxes are seen, as most of them have been sealed and covered to prevent their use by the Nazis in the event of recapture. However, the lanes of dragon's teeth, which were still intact, are shown. They vary from two feet in height to five feet and are approximately three feet square at the base. Construction is of cement over a reinforcement and foundation of steel. The Allied crew disputes previous Nazi claims that the Siegfried Line constitutes an impregnable barrier against invasion of Germany from the west. German civilians help repair roadways damaged during the breaching of the line. Even as this work goes on, First Army units continue the advance that preceded the siege of Aachen. train wings toward the Eindhoven Nijmegen area of Holland with supplies and reinforcements following initial landings of the first Allied Airborne Army. supplies just south of Nijmegen. Here, airborne infantrymen are engaged in securing important bridges and flanking the northern anchor of the Siegfried Line. During the entire Netherland airborne operation, American planes and gliders alone carried nearly six million pounds of supplies and equipment. The following scenes were made with a camera strapped to the chest of a parachutist. concentration of anti-aircraft fire brings further losses in Allied planes, indicating a vigorous attempt on the part of the enemy to stem an Allied drive north from Nijmegen. Fighter planes bring in reinforcements to help broaden the Eindhoven Nijmegen corridor and attempt to establish contact with encircled elements of the British 1st Airborne Division on the north bank of the Lech River. Operating with British forces during the whole period of the airborne invasion were nearly 6,000 American planes and gliders. Of this number, less than 3% were lost despite fierce enemy opposition. A 
to law, which fell on 26th August, an inspection is made of the harbor area. Extensive Allied bombings and Nazi demolitions leveled most of the big installations. This torpedo plant was in full production just prior to the entry of 7th Army troops. The lathes are still in place. On a mountain overlooking the harbor is Fort de C4, built by the French in 1877 and used by the Germans when they occupied southern France. An 88 millimeter gun which guarded the fort has a blown out breach. Fort de la Croix Faron, built in 1873. French coastal guns are set up at strategic points near the fort. Guns and forts were rendered unusable by Allied bombings before D-Day. In 1936, the French installed 320 millimeter dual naval guns to strengthen Toulon's defenses. A range finder and plotting installation. B-24s flying hundreds of miles to the north from bases on Wake Dee Island attacked the Palau Archipelago. The frequent bombings helped to neutralize the enemy's offensive power prior to amphibious invasions. These islands constitute a strategic barrier to the Philippines. Mindanao is some 500 miles due east. The Japs had developed the Palaus as a principal advanced naval base and assembly point for fuel, ammunition and supplies passing between Japan and the southwest Pacific. Coordinated with the land-based heavy bomber sorties is carrier aircraft support from Task Force 58. Torpedo bombers and their fighter escorts leave flight decks to join in the attacks. The combined operations greatly reduced the importance of the Palaus as a Japanese fleet anchorage and air base. In conjunction with the aircraft, surface vessels of Admiral William F. Halsey's 3rd Fleet move in to attack gun emplacements, pillboxes, and other defenses on the beaches and inland. The assault is concentrated mainly on Peleliu and Angaur Islands. Five successive days of bombing and shelling climax the pre-invasion foray. September, initial forces head for Peleliu for first landings in the Palau group. The shelling of the island continues, supplemented by fire from landing craft. Marines of the 1st Division, commanded by Major General William S. Rupertus, drive in force toward the beaches. Reports from Peleliu credit the relatively light losses to the extremely effective call fire and close support fire from the warships offshore and to the accuracy of bombings by the carrier-based aircraft. Peleliu was chosen for the first attack because it contains the best airfield of the archipelago. Within the island, the Jap garrison is holding out in pillboxes, caves and trenches. The strongest point of resistance is along a low coral ridge, nicknamed Bloody Nose Ridge by the Marines. A command post and communication system are quickly set up. Meanwhile, Marines move on the airfield against stiffening resistance. 